Initiative project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Marco, and this is a true crime podcast where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast, and if that's you, welcome home. Today, I am going to dig into a case many of you haven't even heard of, or, you know, maybe you did, but you didn't even think twice about it. Today's predator lurked the hallways of a Veterans Affairs Hospital, attacking unsuspecting victims and even garnering the nickname the Angel of Death. No one really ever realizing she wasn't just bad luck to have around, she was literally a killer. Join me today as I discuss serial killer Retta Mays. Now, let's dig in. My sources for this story include an article by Molly Bourne and Lisa Rain from the Washington Post, a People Magazine article by Jeff Truesdell, articles in AP News, Post Gazette, NPR, 5WDTV, USA Today, and the information filed in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of West Virginia on July 13, 2020. The Veterans Affairs is the government's second largest department, which is something I didn't know. They are responsible for 9 million military veterans. And as veterans know, the VA is usually under attack for its lack of care and its lengthy wait times to be seen. But in this case, it would be under attack for different reasons. Retta Mays was an overall good student. She went to school in Maryland and Delaware, and she went to Glenville State College in West Virginia for a year in the mid-90s while majoring in accounting. For reasons unknown, she didn't go on to get her degree from this college and little else is known about what she did the next few years. After 9-11 rocked the United States, many Americans felt some sort of way about patriotism and Retta was one of those people because six months after 9-11, she joined the West Virginia National Guard. She served as a chemical equipment repairer and she deployed to Iraq in 2003 with the 1092nd Engineer Battalion. She later served in the 115th Engineer Company in Clarksburg. She married a custodian, a man named Gordon, who, according to reports, was kind of a goofy dude, but he was a hard worker, which is probably why Retta was attracted to him. In October of 2006, after serving her military commitment, Retta was discharged from the Guard without issue. Retta is described as a badass, as a woman who can hold her own, especially since she was a woman in a predominantly male organization. And while her next job would show just how badass she actually was. As reported by the Washington Post, from 2005 to 2012, Retta served as a correctional officer at the North Central Regional Jail. And get this, in 2013, she was named in a lawsuit by an inmate. The inmate claimed that Retta held him down and kicked him right before another guard stomped his head. Yikes! The inmate claimed to black out for a few seconds. And when he came to, Retta spit in his face and said, quote, How do you like that, mother? And you ain't that tough now, are you? End quote. The case was later dismissed. But after you hear what she does years later, the inmate scenario doesn't seem that unlikely. From 2012 to 2015, Retta worked for a group home for adults with disabilities called Rest Care. She started out as an entry-level caregiver, and in three years, she became the residential manager. While there, she never had any issues. But Retta had some personal issues going on in the background, right? Her husband of many years, Gordon Mays Jr., he was arrested and subsequently convicted of child pornography charges. So that must have been very tough for Retta. By this point, I should just quickly add that Retta did have two adult sons and a stepson. In 2015, she started a new job. She began to work as a nurse's assistant at the Lewis A. Johnson Veterans Affairs 
Medical Hospital in Clarksburg, West Virginia. The hospital was only four hours from Washington, D.C., and it is said that being a veteran and getting hired by the VA hospital is an honor, and it speaks volumes about the person. Retta was specifically hired to work the graveyard shift from 7.30 p.m. to 8 o'clock in the morning. And you know what? Personally, I say God bless all hospital workers in general, but especially the ones who work that shift. Retta specifically worked in the medical surgical unit referred to as Ward 3A. As a nurse assistant, she was responsible for measuring patients' vitals, documenting intake and output, testing patients' blood glucose levels with a glucometer, and sitting one-on-one with patients who needed to be closely observed. At the hospital, Retta thrived, and the girl did her thing, man. She was known as a go-getter. Whatever you needed, Retta would do it. She was shuttling patients from one wing to the other, taking their vitals. And you know what? You know, she did have one little quirk, or at least the one that they talked about. She spoke in a high-pitched voice that made her sound very young. But everybody has quirks, right? Retta was always at her patient's sides. Many of times, she was there through the night as they slipped away and died. Initially, no one thought anything of it since most of the patients who died on Retta's watch were over the age of 80. But something didn't quite seem right. You you know when there's a situation and it's just so overwhelmingly suspicious, but you can't put your finger on it. That's what was going on here. But this didn't keep the hospital rumors from spreading like wildfire. I mean, if you've ever watched Grey's Anatomy, you know exactly what I'm talking about. After a few more elderly veterans passed away in Ward 3A, VA hospital workers would send each other text messages commenting on how weird it was that Retta was always in the hospital when patients in Ward 3A died. They even gave her the nickname the Angel of Death, but still no one ever really thought the kind-hearted go-getter was a serial killer. But still, all the rumors and messages were all in good fun, or so they thought. In 2018, according to NPR, one doctor was sure something fishy was going on. What put him over the edge was that almost all of the patients who died, died from the same exact thing, unexplained hypoglycemic episodes. I mean, what are the odds that all of the old people die from the same exact thing, especially since they came to the hospital to be treated for different symptoms? But the hypoglycemic thing, It's a blood sugar thing, but most of these patients didn't even suffer from blood sugar issues before entering the hospital. And when I say blood sugar issues, I'm specifically talking about diabetes. So this doctor, the whistleblower, he took his medical oath to heart and reported it as suspicious. Immediately, hospital leadership brought the concerns up and then the VA inspector general got involved and ordered an investigation. This was in June of 2018, and within 24 hours of the investigation, a name kept popping up over and over and over again. Retta Mays, the Angel of Death. Immediately, Retta Mays was named as a person of interest. And because she was a person of interest, they couldn't keep her at Ward 3A, but they didn't really have concrete evidence, so they couldn't really fire her. So they moved her, but they did eventually fire her from the hospital when they determined that old homegirl Retta lied on her dang resume, the nerve of her. Eventually, after lots of digging, and I mean lots of actual digging, you see, the investigators had to inform the deceased veterans' families about the open murder investigation. The investigators needed permission to exhume many veterans who died on Retta's watch. The elderly veterans had been thought to have died of natural causes, But this investigation led investigators to believe they may have actually been murdered. When it comes to vitamins, we all deserve to be a little bit of a skeptic. And if you are, that's a good thing, especially when it comes to vitamins, which is why I choose to take the Ritual Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Ritual created a clinically backed multivitamin for women who are 18 and over. Ritual's multivitamin supports brain health, bone health, blood health, and provides antioxidant support. And above all else, Ritual has traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. I've always, or almost always, been a vitamin consumer. 
but I never liked the taste, chalky and honestly just nasty. I often wondered what all those ingredients even meant on the label, but I figured, hey, I needed the vitamins, so I just put up with the horrid taste and the ingredients I couldn't even pronounce. But that is now an issue of the past, ever since I found Ritual. Because Ritual comes packed with nine key nutrients in two capsules per day, so you can take your vitamins and relax knowing that you are in good hands. Another thing is that Ritual is packaged in a minty capsule that will leave you feeling refreshed. I've been using Ritual Essential for Women for two months now, and I couldn't be happier. So listen up, no more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash military10 to start Ritual or to add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist, someone that you could talk to in a judgment-free zone? Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. And I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office. Sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you, and it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash military murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash military murder to get $100 off your first month and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash military murder. The investigation lasted two whole years and involved over 250 interviews and lots of physical evidence. There were about a dozen suspicious deaths during the time frame in question, which was roughly a year from 2017 to 2018. But after the investigation concluded, they could only definitively tie about seven or eight deaths to Retta Mays. And with that, 46-year-old Retta Mays was charged with seven counts of second-degree murder and one count of assault with intent to commit murder. And you know what? She pled guilty. During her guilty plea, she told the judge that she took advantage of a flaw in the hospital computer software program. The software was so bootleg that it didn't properly register patients' glucose numbers when taken. So when Retta discovered this, she took advantage. Additionally, while Retta was not hired, nor was she certified to provide insulin shots to patients, the location where the insulin was stored was not monitored. So tiny little Retta was able to sneak in and grab doses to administer to unsuspecting patients. Now, I want to actually describe how all of her crimes went down. Eighty two year old Navy veteran Robert Edge Sr. was a Korean War veteran, and he had been married to Joanne for 64 years before she died in early 2017. After serving in the Navy, he worked for 30 plus years in engineering and maintenance at Westinghouse. On July 19th, 2017, while at the VA hospital in Ward 3A, Retta injected him with a deadly dose of insulin. And while he was diabetic, the insulin had not been ordered, nor did he have an actual prescription for insulin. He died the next day on July 20th, 2017. After this, it appears that Retta lay low for a while, right? She didn't want to bring any attention to herself. But within five months, she got the urge to kill again. Because in January of 2018, 89-year-old 
Army veteran Robert Pappy Kazul was admitted into Ward 3A after suffering a stroke. Pappy served as a parachutist in the Korean War, and he was a retired machinist. He had just celebrated his 89th birthday, and he was so excited and looking forward to celebrating the big 9-0 a year later. Unfortunately, that celebration would never come because Retta injected him with a deadly dose of insulin. Not only was it not prescribed, but he wasn't even diabetic. But still, with his death, everyone suspected he died of natural causes, especially because he had just had a stroke. The next time, Retta was fearless in her killings because she had two under her belt and no one suspected a thing. So, in March of 2018, she struck again. This time, her victim was 84-year-old Archie Edel. He was a Korean War veteran who loved playing instruments. He suffered from dementia and he went to Ward 3A strictly for an examination. The doctors and family wanted to get him examined to determine if he should be moved to a nursing home. He went to Ward 3A and spent the night to be observed. And of course, in the middle of the night, in walked old homegirl Retta. And Archie's murder would turn out to be more bold than the rest. Get this, Retta injected Archie with insulin. And when his vitals went haywire, doctors and nurses came rushing in with crash carts to bring his levels back to normal. And... They were successful. Archie was a freaking fighter. But the very next day, a brazen red amaze injected poor Archie again. This time, she wouldn't fail because Archie ended up dying. After his death and burial, his wife of 62 years allowed Archie's body to be exhumed. During an autopsy, it was discovered that Archie had four, I repeat, four injection sites on his body. What in the world? He was only there to be examined. I mean, he had zero reasons to have injection sites. April of 2018 was the deadliest month in Ward 3A. You would think someone would notice, and while they did take notice, it's possible they just didn't think anyone was capable of killing elderly VA patients. 81-year-old George Shaw was a 28-year Air Force veteran. He was a veteran of the Korean War and the Vietnam War. He was so all-inspiring that his daughter, Linda, also joined the Air Force and she served out her time, 22 years to be exact. After retiring from the Air Force, George worked as a supervisor of the mailroom at the very VA hospital where Retta worked. George and his wife, Norma, they had been married for 59 years. In March of 2018, George, who already suffered from heart disease and mild dementia, he began experiencing weakness and trouble breathing. Due to his complications, his family decided to take him to the VA hospital, a place he knew all too well from his time working and volunteering there, and his family knew he'd be well taken care of. He was admitted on March 22nd, and they said he would be released just a few days later. But, a day before his scheduled release, he suffered from extremely low blood sugar, an oddity since he was not diabetic. Once his blood sugar dropped below an acceptable level, he never recovered and he died two weeks later. And guess whose care he was under? You got it, Retta Mays. When his body was exhumed, it was determined that he too had received four insulin shots during his care at the hospital. In the same month, Felix McDermott would meet the same fate. Army Sergeant Felix McDermott was a Vietnam veteran. He had served 11 years active duty as a parachutist, and then he transferred to the Pennsylvania Guard. In addition to retiring from the military, he was a retired truck driver. Felix had spent the last three years living at a nursing home. But on this occasion, he had been admitted to the VA hospital because of aspiration pneumonia. Felix, not even a diabetic going into the hospital, suffered the same fate, low glucose levels, and he died. His body was later exhumed and it was determined that he died by homicide. He had been murdered by Retta. Then again in April, a 96-year-old, I repeat, a 96 year Can you imagine getting to that age? It's just amazing. A 96-year-old Army World War II veteran by the name of William Sport Holloway. 
he was admitted into Ward 3A and boom, he also died. Two months after that, Army and Air Force veteran 88-year-old Raymond Golden went into the hospital but died while in Ward 3A. Retta's final victim was Russell Big Russ Posey. He was 92 years old and he had served in the Navy and was a World War II veteran. He was a heck of a businessman, at one point running six businesses all at once. He entered the hospital sometime in June, even spending Father's Day there, and he was fine. But soon thereafter, Retta Mays struck again. His glucose levels took a nosedive, and while he hung on for dear life, he never recovered, and he died on July 3rd, 2018. But by the time he died, he was already back at his nursing home. Sadly, eventually, when Retta's evilness had been exposed, it was far too late. And while investigators determined she killed the seven veterans I already mentioned, the medical examiner in Big Russ's case could not say with enough certainty that he died due to the insulin injection. So this is the one case that you see charged as assault with intent to commit murder. Make no mistake about it. Big Russ died at Retta May's hands but she could only be charged with assault. On July 2020, Retta Mays, the 46-year-old Iraq war veteran who looks super homely in her mugshot, well, she ended up pleading guilty to the charges. She stood in front of the judge, not really offering up a motive, just indicating that she was taking medication for her post-traumatic stress disorder. We never learn why she has PTSD, whether it's service-related or something else. Retta's MO was to inject the elderly veterans. Then she would diabolically sit next to them as if watching over them. She sat there knowing full well that internally, all of her victims' organs were shutting down one by one. But the deaths didn't all require the same amount of time. Some of the men died within hours, while others held on for weeks at a time before succumbing to the insulin. Apparently, the prosecutor determined that a plea agreement was the best thing in this case, since it was a strictly circumstantial case. There were no cameras, no evidence that she was the one that took the insulin from its open and accessible location. There were other nurses, doctors, aides, all on duty at the same time. And while she was the common denominator, they felt that this was one of the most complex cases ever encountered by the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office. And while she pled guilty to eight cases, there were other deaths that could have been caused by Retta. But according to the U.S. Attorney, they couldn't be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So they were never charged. The crazy thing is that when you peel back the facade just a little bit, There were serial killer signs dating back to at least October of 2007 when the Mays family had, get this, two back-to-back house fires. What in the actual hell? I understand one house fire, but two and then back-to-back? As reported by the Washington Post and stated by Gary Schlang, a retired insurance adjuster, the first fire was ruled to be an electrical fire that started on the porch and the second fire was ruled as arson. Well, Retta, ever the smart woman, together with her husband, they sued the insurance company and Schlang, the adjuster, claiming that they were using unethical delay tactics to keep from paying the family. And guess what? The suit, believe it or not, was settled out of court in favor of the maze. You are probably all wondering, what is the VA hospital doing now to ensure that this never happens again. Well, according to the Washington Post, the hospital has tighter controls on insulin and other drugs likely to be abused. But that's really it. They do not appear to be looking into the matter any further. And this entire nightmare still does not give the victim's families any closure. Retta's sentencing hearing is scheduled to take place in February of 2021. Yes, this exact month. She is facing multiple life sentences, and I am sure she will get what she deserves. But none of this will ever bring closure to the families. Unless Retta gives her motive during the sentencing hearing in a few weeks, they may never know why, which only adds to their pain. 
If you thought Retta Mays was a one-of-a-kind killer, you would be wrong, my friend, because in my research, I came across another VA employee just as evil as Retta, if not even more evil. Her name is Kristen Gilbert. I will just give you a little background on her as a kind of like a mini bonus to this episode. Kristen Heather Gilbert was known as a pathological liar since she was a young girl. She was the oldest of two girls and maybe she was always dying for attention. She would frequently fake suicide attempts in an effort to manipulate situations. She was born and raised in Massachusetts and she began college there, but was ordered into psychiatric treatment due to her bizarre behavior. Eventually, she was released and in 1988, at the age of 21, she became a registered nurse. A year later, she joined the team as an RN at the Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Northampton. Her case is so similar to Retta's that it's actually kind of scary. Many patients died on her watch, and when I say many, I actually mean over 350 patients over the course of seven years. And similarly, co-workers nicknamed her the Angel of Death. In 1996, however, a few nurses were suspect and they reported that they were concerned by the increased cardiac arrest that also coincided with the low supply of epinephrine, aka adrenaline. I'm sure I said that wrong. It turns out that adrenaline was Kristen's weapon of choice. During her shift, she would inject patients with the drug, which induced a cardiac arrest. When everyone came rushing into the rooms, she would take part happily in reviving her patients. Isn't that just insanity? Well, of course, once the nurses reported the issues, an investigation quickly ensued. But Kristen Gilbert actually tried to derail the entire investigation by calling in a bomb threat at the hospital. <laughs> I can't. I can't. There's, she, this girl's like off her rocker. Well, she ended up getting busted for calling in the bomb threat and was eventually convicted for that terrorist act and served 15 months in jail. Kristen was eventually charged with various murders of her patients and the trial was wild. Let me just say this. In 2001, she was convicted of three counts of first degree murder, one count of second degree murder, and two counts of attempted murder. While prosecutors sought the death penalty, she was ultimately sentenced to four consecutive life sentences plus 20 years. And the most insane part is how this woman was able to hide in plain sight. She had committed so many egregious offenses besides murder before actually getting caught. For example, before even becoming an RN, she was working as a home health aide and on one occasion, she purposefully scalded a mentally handicapped child with piping hot water while in the bath. But wait, there's more. As a teenager, she used to make violent threats to others. She once used a large kitchen knife to assault someone. She twice tried to poison someone and she caused a medical emergency at the hospital by removing someone's breathing tube. Prosecutors later claimed that Kristen would actually use these cardiac arrests and her life-saving tactics to get the attention of her boyfriend, who happened to be a VA security guard. Kristen Gilbert's victims were, were veterans Stanley Jagodowski, Henry Hudden, Kenneth Cutting, and Edward Skira. Kristen Gilbert is infamous. There are documentaries and books about her. But I would recommend Snapped, Notorious Kristen Gilbert. Make sure that you're following me on social media because I will be providing an update on Retta's sentence as soon as I know it. You can find me on social on Instagram at Military Murder Podcast and on Facebook at Military True Crime. And remember, for as little as a dollar a month, you can join the Patreon fan club to get completely ad-free shows. And right now, if you join the fan club at the dotted line or above levels, you have access to at least five, I think, or six or seven bonus episodes. So head on over to patreon.com slash military murder to check it out. Shout out to some of my newest patrons, Shelby A and Reba B. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions and produced in collaboration with my bootcamp and higher fan club members. 
This week's newest associate producer is Margaret S. And the music was created by Tie Ops. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of. So remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. Podcast.